God, our light and our light.
kernel? What is the what is the essence of what Jesus wants to communicate here? What is the important part that Jesus wants to communicate? Be ready. All right, that's number one. Okay, and we get that. Be be prepared for you know night, no night, the day, the hour. What else? Be faithful. Be faithful. Yeah, that's kind of the, and that's kind of the um, the the picture there of the of the wicked the wicked servant. You kind of you know the expression, and maybe this is a bad expression for me to use. The when the cats away, the mice will play. Well, that's sort of the. It seems like I use that occasionally when I go on vacation. Maybe I should be referring to as mice. Um, but pardon the sheep. When the shepherd's away, the sheep will stray. Yeah. Oh, that's, that sounds much better. That's what I'm saying. The shepherd's away, the sheep will stray. All right. Um, so, so what's going on here with this servant, with the wicked servant, is he believes he believes that he can predict when the master's going to return. Master is delayed because is it coming when I think he's going to come? And because of that, he simply relinquishes all of his responsibilities, beats his fellow servants, eats and drinks with drunkards. Are there any other parables that you can think of that kind of give this same this the same impression of the same point in connection with well, if the master's it, the master is not going to come for a long time, and so I might as well do whatever I want. Dennis? Talents. Yeah, the parable of the talents. Sure. Is there another one? Ada? All right. Believe me, that's how I've been for about a week now. So, <laughs> yeah. When they made up the idols. Sure. All right. Yes, that's an excellent one from Exodus. Um, right, when uh, when the people of Israel are down at the base of the mountain and Moses is still up there talking and listening to God and, and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait and they don't think he's coming back and who was it, by the way, that actually kind of gave in? It was Aaron. Yeah, no, the high priest. That's not so good. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely not so good. Um, so yeah, so we have kind of a long history of this of, of this presumption, and this really is must be really frustrating for God, because and and, uh, and again, I'm sure that there are many other parables, but there is a sense that for mom and dad, that when mom and dad leave, they want to make sure they want to trust that their kids are not going to totally destroy the house while they're gone, right? Basically, every comedy. Not every comedy, but an awful lot of the comedies from the 80s and 90s were were kind of variations of the mom and dad home, or home alone, mom and dad are gone. I wonder what interesting things are gonna happen before they get back, right? That's just a running, a running sort of theme, and we get that same same picture here. So you have what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is uh, is receiving and knowing what is good and right and true, and doing this even, even when it does not seem as though someone's looking over your shoulder. You know, it's very easy to do what's right, or maybe it's very obvious to do what's right when, uh, when somebody is looking right over your shoulder. But it is much harder when there is no one watching. And that's kind of the, it's kind of the premise there, really. On, um, on behind behind this layer. Uh, this makes me think of it, but as I read through different things in the Bible, I keep coming somewhere in the shadows. I keep seeing this or feeling this thing of supremacy issues. Mm -hmm. In other words, whenever we actively either as a group, racially, what, individually, right. whatever, you know, religiously, because right. I think. It, Islam in that term. Sure. Try to prove supremacy, you know, you start eating servants and, and trying to force. Right. We have this tremendous problem that people. I would 
And uh, it, that's, a, that's a very good observation. And, and I would and I would point out, I think a part of what's going on with that is our inability to recognize the humanity of others. One of the things that you'll hear about whenever we get to higher things is that I was one of the plenary speakers for for this one, which meant that I, I was kind of in the hot seat. And the last the last day, I conscripted our uh, our youth. Uh, uh, to help me tell the tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, and uh, and so uh, Caleb was the uh, one who was mostly dead on the road. And he, he did a good job acting there. So uh, you know, once you're once you're dead, you're dead. Um, but uh, but a part of a part of what I did with that was kind of ran a string of about twenty pictures of of people. Uh, men, women, different races, you know, disabled, angry, um, you know, a, a, a skinhead, uh, Hillary, Donald Trump, you know, kind of all kinds of different people with, and then asking the question, well, would you help someone if they look like this? What if they look like this? What if they look like this? What if they look like this? And, and a, a big part of what tends to happen is we want and are willing to help people that look and act like us, but when, uh, oh, but it's very easy for us to forget who who is the other. The other is the one who needs mercy, and not the one who looks and acts just like us. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the point. And the kids did a very good job, by the way. I think it was uh, well appreciated. And kept people kept people on their toes on the last. Last day of the conference when nobody was having to sleep for a few days. So I can use all the help I can get at that point. Um, yeah, Ann. Did I hear you correctly? You said, can you imagine if God is frustrated? Yeah. Does God get frustrated with us? I think that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, and we certainly see in the Old Testament God's, uh, yeah, well, there's no question that we deserve it. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is not the question. And, and we certainly get things with, uh, in, in the Psalms, for instance, or we'll, we'll hear over and over again, God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that, you know, that he is patience, that he is patient, and, and, and all of these. Um, what I will say is, slow to anger does not mean no anger. Yeah. And there is a, and there is a difference um, between forgiveness and permissiveness. Um, and... And that's a part of what we see in, and I'll call it uh, uh, talking about law and gospel, is that God, according to His, according to His law, shines the mirror of His law on us, and and shows us that what we what we deserve is is death and hell, but that what God gives is uh, finally His mercy, and and I'll use the. I'll, I'll use the analogy again because I, I really think this is this is why God is called a heavenly father, is that a father and mother can can and do get angry with their children. But that anger uh, should not be the, the kind of the ultimate deciding relationship. I mean that's it. If anger becomes the ultimate deciding relationship, that's called abuse. Um, and and so when when I as a parent or you as a, as a parent get angry with your child, that you don't want that to you don't want it to last, and you don't want your child to receive that as kind of the ultimate picture of you. I mean, and, and I would I would even argue this is what we have in our catechism and love God so that etc. Um, and that's a and that is difficult and that's even made all the more difficult today I think because um, our culture has real real problems with boundaries and has and has real problems with kind of understanding that that because I discipline someone this is not a the discipline is not a sign of hatred. Um, it's a sign of love, and, and that is just a 
a fundamental problem that we have in our society. And you can see that top to bottom. And because of the abuse of, of discipline, which heaven knows has been abused in many and various ways and has been used as a cover-up for all sorts of evil um, for as long as there have been people. Um, but that, that abuse does not eliminate the need for discipline itself. Now that's obviously a whole huge can of worms, but I do. But it's it's important that we start to kind of get that into our head and thinking because of these end times pictures that we're going to get in the rest of 24 and through 25. So so we're going to circle back to that question a few different times and see some different ways that that that's painted in scripture. Well, but I think I go back to something that the uh, pastor Mark impressed on me one time. Does he answer your questions even when he's not here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He impressed on me once that the uh, Ten Commandments were built on lock. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can see we're a mess, we need some rules, sure. uh, some discipline, and it's all based on love, and then that frustration that God would have also comes from like a parent placed in love. And, and maybe frustration isn't the best word because frustration yeah. sounds like an emotional, an emotional response because of my own lack of control. Um, at least that's that's how I feel when I trust. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, so maybe frustration isn't the right word. But disappointment or anger or even anger, I'm 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 not willing to give up on that anger word or shy away from that anger word. I really think we need to wrestle with that more. Um, but but I can I can definitely get the. Frustration implies a lack of a lack of control that I that I don't believe you see in the scripture. Kat. Well we hear, you know, many times that God is dealing with through the Israelites or with there were through to many people of God's wrath, of his sure. righteous wrath. That is definitely something that I would associate with anger. If yep. not, yeah. you know, that, that is not a... Right. And this is also why, by the way, that God pours out his wrath on the cross. I mean, that that is where God's wrath is finally poured out. It's on, it's on the cross. And we miss that. And, and boy, the whole thing just, it just goes able there. Because, and that's kind of the... That, that is the great tragedy of the last day. Is God pours out his wrath like his son um, for... for for all sin. So this is where God has poured out his wrath. And, and at the last day, um, you have those that say, no, I would rather just take God's wrath myself. I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to give up God's wrath. I'm going to receive it myself instead of Jesus receiving it for me. Now it's I mean it's tragic. I mean that is that is tragic at, at the so many ways, but that's the essence of, of what what is happening. Yeah. Um, going back to the very first verse, um, who then is the faithful and wise servant? Right. Um, you have to have faith in someone greater than yourself. Sure. For this to actually be happen. Right. It's not faithfulness in yourself. Right. It's faithfulness right. in this uh, master. That there is an object to that faith. Because I trust that the master is going to return and that he has given me these things to give out, I will do so and be faithful. He's trusted me right. to do his work mm -hmm. while he is gone. Right. Right. Thank you for this point. We're going to move on. So we got all kinds of fun stuff to do. And, uh, and this is... Uh, one of the most famous parables, I would say, in the in the New Testament, the parable of the of the ten virgins. So I'm going to read the whole the whole thing, which is two two screens, uh, thirteen verses, and then we'll go back and look at it. Uh, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. 
For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. While they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. All right. So we get, uh, we get again, uh, Jesus gives us the point of the parable. Right? That's verse 13. Watch therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour. That's the point of the parable. I, I love it when Jesus tells us what the point is. So we don't have to guess what the point is. He tells us, you don't know day or the hour, watch, and we could add to that our, our Boy Scout motto, be prepared, be ready along the way, be faithful. So, um, and, and notice too, this is the kingdom of heaven, so this is, this is Jesus' uh, shorthand for, do you remember how, I, how I've described that phrase before? God works in the world like this. God rules the world like this. This is how God works. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. The, the reign of God, the rule of God, will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bride. Um, a couple cultural things on this uh, uh, on, on, on this parable. Uh, first off, uh, a wedding in Jesus' day is a um, both a simpler and a more elaborate affair in different ways. It's, uh, it's simpler in the sense that the wedding service uh, most likely is, is much simpler where simply the, the father of the, of the bride gives his daughter to the bridegroom and that's, and that's it. So, there is no kind of long Sessions and these, and these sort of things, but what what is more elaborate is the is the notion of the feast that this is that this is the great celebration of of life and of how God works and of God's continuation in the world and His continuation of His people because marriage is where children come from and so this is about the past and about the present and about the future all wrapped up. So this is the celebration. This is a joyful event. This is not a sorrowful event in any way. Even though there are many tears shed. Um, so, so these are ten, ten virgins who took their lamps and men went to meet meet the bridegroom. So they are there to enter in to. The, the feast here. The ten virgin purity. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that you would. That you would. I mean, and, and we can even see kind of leftovers. Isn't quite the right term, but I'll, I'll use it. Left, kind of vestiges of the same idea that that both the bride and the groom have attendants who are with them. I mean, that's kind of the that's kind of the idea here is that these are the attendants, right? Right, um, and so the, these ten take their lamps and go to meet the meet the bridegroom. So these lamps are oil lamps, not unlike our our uh, the candles that we use here. Five were uh, foolish, and that's the word uh, moroni, no, moroni, and five and five were wise, which is the word um, so. Sophia is is a Greek for wisdom. So five uh, five are are foolish and five are wise. 
Yes, Karen. So what kind of people are foolish? Uh, are those non-believers? Um, that is a, that, that's a good question. That's a part of what's interesting about this parable. parable. And, I'll, and I'll say that we can, we can speculate a little bit. All right? And, but in parables, in any parable, you have to you have to kind of get at what is the what is the kernel point of it. Okay, recognize what is the the point of this parable. Which Jesus told us, right? Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. That's the point. Now we can look at the rest of it, but but we have to be careful not to kind of pull apart every thread. Because eventually, when you pull apart every thread, there's not going to be anything left. Okay, so, um, and certainly the the why wisdom is is often a um, is often a, a parallel or a synonym for faith, and and foolishness is the opposite of wisdom, and so that would be unbelief. So I you know, I don't think that you're wrong. I, I, that, that is basically the point here, but um, but that's but we do have to be careful not to not to get down too too far. Yes, Catherine. Sorry. Uh, By all means. Um, but they were there. But they were there, and they so they didn't continue to be faithful. Right, that? and and that's that is a couple of the interesting things here. They were there. The problem was is that they weren't prepared. So you've got they've got their lamps, but they didn't but they didn't do their their pre-marriage checklist <laughs> on their lamps, right? That's that's along the way. And and another another little kind of point that I find very interesting is as the bridegroom was delayed, so here's the same, you don't know the day or the hour. This is you don't you can't kind of pin down this time as they were like they how many of them? They all became drowsy and slept. So this is not that some of them, uh, some of them were prepared, were ready, etc., etc., etc. They all became drowsy and slept. I don't know this for 100 percent certainty, but I will engage in quite a speculation here and say I don't think they were supposed to. Okay, I mean that is a part of kind of a part of the point here. It's not the point, but it's a merit. <laughs> Apparently, we all sleep when something's happening to Christ because they slept in in the garden before. Yeah, I mean, if you get to sleep, sleep, right? And sleep is another one of these awake, uh, awake, sleep, prepared, unprepared, and you know Jesus. Jesus chides the disciples for falling asleep at the garden, right? Um, but that it, that doesn't have the same um, that doesn't have the same weight as 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 being called a moron. That doesn't have the same weight as moroni. You know, being the over oversleeping is not is not a parallel to unbelief. There, I don't think. Uh, I'm assuming what uh, what would be in our Christian checklist? Well, the faith. I mean, that's the that's the, the that is definitely the and 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 we we'll, 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 we're going to get to that. I promise. Okay. So give me seven. I mean, that there was a bride. Here's the bride group. Come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, that it's got the width, the right height, got everything ready. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for your, for our lamps are going out. The wise answered, saying, still there will, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers, buy for yourselves. One of the, and I guess I would say one of the debates on this parable would be the, what is the oil? Is the oil faith? Is the oil Jesus? Um, you know, so kind of what is what is that precisely? And I don't think you 
can give up a definitive answer. The oil is what you need. That, that's, that's the point of the parable here. So the oil is what you need. Kind of answering what you need is kind of given elsewhere. But, um, and, and so I'm, I, I think you can make a pretty good argument for saying the oil, the oil is Jesus, and the oil is faith in Jesus. It's certainly not going down to the, that means baptism and the Lord's Supper and attending church at least four times a year or, you know, something like that. It's, it's not doing that, because that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is not a minimalist <laughs> thing. And that's, and, uh, and I've even preached this, this kind of thing on, the, uh, on, on this text before. Because the, the wise are ready. And being ready is not a, it's not a kind of one-time shot. It is, uh, it is a continual, it's a state of being. <laughs> it's not simply a one-time event. I, and, and maybe this is a poor analogy and that the checklist thing is going to get me in trouble. But um, if, if you were, and, and you guys can tell me if I'm a heretic or if I'm just wrong on that. If you were... A, uh, a paratrooper in an airplane, um, and you and you saw on the parachute checked by so and so sixteen months ago. I guess you would check it again, right? First of all, because it's a job, <laughs> and then and then you have a, a specific. Readiness profile <laughs> that's going to happen. There's going to be a very specific list of these are the things that you check. This is cross check. You check it. Maybe somebody else even has to check it so that you're checking out each other's each other's equipment, etc. But that that readiness is not just a okay. This happened once. Now it's done. That's kind of that. And and I would put that another way and say faith isn't a thing to be possessed. Let me say that again. Faith is not a thing to be possessed. If faith were a thing to be possessed, then we could simply baptize someone, give them the thing, and then that would be the end of it. And if you really wanted to push that analogy all the way, you could say that the, the kindest thing you could do to a person, since you know that they have the thing right then, would be to kill them. Because then you know they're going to die in faith because you just gave them the thing that they need. Which obviously is ridiculous <laughs> and wrong. Um, but if we think of faith as a thing to be possessed, then we turn, we turn faith kind of on its ear and we and I can I can always get to this. Okay, I've got it. I don't have to reflect on that anymore. <laughs> faith is something that is continually given. It, it faith is is trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and it is an on, it is an ongoing state of being. It's not a possession that one gets. Now, who gives faith? And who sustains faith is Jesus. Now that's the sermon this morning. So it's not like this is this is not a works righteousness thing. But this is why we get all of these other parables and examples from Jesus, like I am the vine, you are the branches. You know, the one who abides in me and I in him will live forever. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, so if Jesus is the vine and you are the branches, you cut the branch off of the vine, what's going to happen? It's going to die. Because that's what vines do when they're cut off from the source of life. Now, you could cut off a branch from a vine and look at it and maybe for a while couldn't tell that it was dead. Right? It's going to look alive for a while. But it is dead. Because it has no ongoing source of life. Uh, so too with faith. Faith is, faith is connected to God's work in 
disconnect faith from God and His Word, no faith. I think the difficult thing about this parable is exactly where did the preparedness come from? It's kind of misleading. Right. You, Absolutely. It you think that it's worth that, it. Right, that they're the ones doing it. And that's why I really want to stress at the beginning of it, the point of the parable is simply be ready. The point of the parable isn't you got to make sure that you've got your oil. Because then you're then you're ending in law, right? And don't share your oil with anybody else. And don't share your oil with anybody else. All of a sudden we've got an excellent anti-evangelism program. Right? That's not the point of the parable. And so you you do have to be wise at recognizing what is Jesus teaching in this story. Okay? Well we I, I, I said before what we did with, uh, with the Higher Things group was, was teach the point of the Good Samaritan. The point of the Good Samaritan is that the Samaritan is merciful to this one. He doesn't know whether this guy is dead or alive. He doesn't know if this guy is a Jew or a Samaritan or a Roman. He's been stripped. Uh, he's been left half dead. He doesn't know. What he knows is that this, this guy is in need. And has compassion on him. That's what he knows. And so he has mercy on him. That's the point of the parable. The point of the parable isn't, uh, uh, isn't well, as long as they look like they're mostly dead, then you can help them. But if they're only half dead, then you can go, go pass them by. That is not the point of the parable. All right. Um, so... And, and if we were to say that the oil is faith, you could, you could make the argument, you can't believe for another person. You know, so, so I can't believe for my son. Because that's not, that's not how it works. Faith comes from, from God, through his word. So I can't believe on behalf of another person, no matter how much I want to. And, and I'm going to guess that everybody in here has people that they wish they could believe for them. But faith doesn't work that way. Faith is given to them. So, Levi. I mean, wouldn't the, if we get on this big applicabilities from this week, and I think we think of this as the second coming of Jesus, right? Sure. But for the disciples who heard this, and the disciples who heard right. this, right? This is more preparation for that. Part. Well, and that's and that's kind of the interesting the interesting challenge with this whole section is is we really want to we want to chop everything up into into these. Well, is it a preparation for death or is it a preparation for the last day? Well, you know, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> and and maybe uh, and maybe trying to make that division kind of doesn't matter all that much. And as we'll see in a second, hopefully, um, that uh, another answer to that might be, well, is this preparation for the Lord's Supper? Because that's certainly how uh, how our Lutheran forebearers saw this saw this parable, at least in part. So, so it's very you've, you've got to be real careful making those decisions to ask, is that actually the point? Okay, yeah. Someone before me for me to love and care for, 
this place and this time now, then even if Jesus is returning tomorrow, that person is in front of me right now. And they're the one that is in need right now. And so it doesn't matter when Jesus is coming back because their need in front of me right now hasn't changed. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what we do. Right, and ultimately, it doesn't, doesn't matter what we do. And that's, and that's kind of the whole, that's the essence of the love your neighbor is you don't, you don't do these things because of some uh, because of what Jesus does. You do this thing because that person needs it. <laughs> because it's just the right thing to do. A lot of and and the more that we end up getting bent out of shape over over kind of asking ourselves why we do things, the more likely we are to talk ourselves out of actually doing those right. Does that make does that make sense? I mean, I mean as, as Lutherans as, and as uh, a lot of German in Lutheranism, we are we're very good at, at kind of at analyzing and really getting down to the minutia, um, and that is not that is not a bad thing. Having said that, that can actually keep us from seeing the neighbor that needs us right in front of us. Yeah. I think in the same way, this is something that Lutherans kind of do because of that Germanness or whateverness, is that I think that we do help others. And I think that our church, one of the strengths of our church is there are a lot of people doing a lot of things nobody knows about. And sometimes we feel bad about that, like we need to be more out there, we need to be more flashy, and because we want people to see all the good we're doing. But again, that isn't the point. No. The point is doing the good, right. even if no one sees it. Right. Not getting and, praise, not and, in order to something else. And sometimes I think it, it is dangerous because we feel like in our world today we need to be more flashy. Right, I can only do something if I can make sure that it's, it's properly good. cited on social media. Yeah, it's going to look good on Facebook. Yeah. But you know what? Good All right, I'm going to, uh, just for a moment, <coughs> in, in kind of closing up here, I want to, want to look at uh, the hymn that is written uh, about this parable, and that hymn is um, Walk It Out, Wake Away. Um, and this is, this is the story of uh, Philip Nikolai, who is a pastor, during the bubonic plague that took 1,400 of his parishioners, including 170. You know, every time I feel tired, you know, think of, uh, wow. So he wrote a series of meditations called Joyer Spiegel, Joy, Joy Speaker, or Mirror of Joy, to which he appended these two hymns. So you can connect into that he wrote. Day by day, I wrote up my meditations found myself, thank God, wonderfully well comforted in heart, joyful in spirit, and truly content. Gave to my manuscript name and title of a mirror of joy, and took this as a to leave behind. If God should call me for a world as a token of my peaceful, joyful Christian departure, or if God should spare me help to comfort other sufferers, I should also visit with the pestilence. So this, uh, so this hymn is one that we sing at the end of the church here if not the last Sunday, one of the last couple of Sundays of the church here. Um, and I, and uh, I want to point out just a couple things on it. Uh, first of all is the, uh, is the joyful expectation that he has at the Lord's return. You know? The bridegroom comes, awake, your lamps of gladness take, hallelujah. The bridal care yourselves prepare to meet the bridegroom who is near. This is not a, everybody look busy, Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Which is kind of how we, we can think of the last day is, oh, I got all this stuff I got to get done. And, and stress about it. And that's the opposite of what he's, what he's got here and, and the way he approaches it. Um, and this uh, this stanza, of course, this is written in German. This this stanza in English, um, 
it, it to me is the most remarkable for a couple reasons. One, you can notice that he actually writes this so that it looks like a chalice in the meditation. You see that? It looks like a cup. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's a theological term for that. Um, and then, and then at the end of this, this is the verse: Zion hears the watchman springing, and all, and all her heart with joy is springing. She wakes, she rises from her gloom. So there's this picture. This is a joyful come. This is a joyful return. Um, but look at the, the end of it here. Now come, thou blessed one, Lord Jesus, God's own Son. Hail, Hosanna! We enter all the wedding hall to eat the supper at thy call, and which is a fantastic translation. Uh, the word there, the wedding hall and supper, the word there is Abend, which is the German word uh, evening meal. And that's the German word for the last supper. It's the evening, it's the evening meal, it's the evening supper. Our Lord Jesus Christ on that night when he was betrayed. And so Nikolai makes this tie with saying, you come and enjoy to the supper, you are coming to the last day. So you enter into his presence with singing, with joy, because we now enter into the, the wedding hall, the hall of, of the great, of the bridegroom. It's my, maybe my favorite verse in the hymnal, which is saying a lot. Um, and, the, and then the final one uh, gets this, uh, gets the last day part at the end there. No eye has seen the light, no ear has heard the might of thy glory. Therefore, we eternally sing hymns of praise and joy to thee. So it's amazing. I'm sure we can sing it more, but it's good. And with that, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Here we go.